you by Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Yeah, and who else for Texas than Janae Jefferson, a staple All-American. She's one of the best leadoff hitters in the entire country, a true five-tool player, can do it all. And then for Florida State, it's Sydney Sherrill. She has been the third baseman, the rock of the defense for Florida State. She was the ACC Defensive Player of the Year last year. If she can come up with some big, big hits, some quality ABs, Florida State's going to be rolling with the potent offense they have. And as far as foundational pieces go, you can say the same for Kat Sandercock, the senior pitcher for Florida State. Yeah. Catherine Sandercock had an incredible 2021 season, and she's picking up right where she left off. She is a power pitcher. She's going to throw in the high 60s. She pounds the lower half of the zone with that drop ball. But you can also sprinkle in a rise ball, a little change up, just to keep things mixed up for her and to keep these hitters off balance that she's going to face for Texas today. She's waited her time to be the premier pitcher in this program going up against Mike White's Texas squad with Jefferson at the top. Scott, who just made her debut, hitting in the number two spot. And a mainstay there in the cleanup spot with Mary Iacopo as well. Jefferson, first pitch swinging, flares it out to left, and it's just a couple steps for Mudge to retire the leadoff hitter. And there's one away in the top of the first. Jefferson wasting absolutely no time, just jumping all over the first pitch. She knew what she was looking for and attacked it and ended up not getting a base hit, but was right on Sandra Cox's pitch. So the preseason All-ACC teamer deals a strike to the freshman Mia Scott, who saw the first action of her collegiate career Wednesday in her home debut for the Longhorns against McNeese State. And what a start it was. She collected two triples in that game. Already high praise from her head coach talking about how she is, for them, a miniature version at this point in her career of Janae Jefferson with what they can do one and two at the top of the lineup. Really difficult outs. Yeah, she's a prime example of when you get an opportunity at a young age, get your feet wet, you go and have an explosive day at the plate, and you earn yourself a potential starting position. That's what the preseason's all about. And Mia Scott might be a fantastic example of that this season, of somebody that just, again, took advantage of the opportunity when given to her. And it's a good mix of youth, not only to the top of the lineup, but to the team as well. That was 43 and 14 last year and picked ninth overall in the D1 softball preseason poll as they bring back 10 players who saw action in at least 30 games last year, but also transfers, an impactful part of their offseason, bringing in 11 new players between transfers and freshmen. Yeah, no doubt this Longhorn offense especially is so talented. They were third in the nation last year on batting average. They hit 342 as a team. That is unbelievable. And despite the fact that their offense was that good, they still finished third in Big 12, and that's a credit to how good Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are. And that's where they are preseason as well in the poll with Oklahoma now going for a decade straight at the top of that preseason poll. So a good measure of where you fit in in the national stage just by who you see at the top of your own conference. It was an early hack from Jefferson as she flied out to left. And a battle here between the senior in the circle and the freshman at the plate as the count goes full. is up the middle that squeaks into center field the speedy scott is aboard as she takes the payoff and turns it into a single now, nine, scott stays hot through that first at bat and what a mature at bat for the freshman sandercock is such a great pitcher has world series experience world series finals experience and she took her to a full count 
and ended up with a nice single up the middle. Simple, clean, easy hitting. Parker going after the first offering, turns it into strike one. This Texas squad opened their season in the state of Florida last weekend. The FGCU kickoff classic opened with a nice win against one of the more potent programs from the ACC, shutting out Clemson 4 0. They fell against Florida Gulf Coast, the host of that, picked up a couple wins against BC and avenged their defeat at the hands of FGCU. That's from the circle to second for one and a turn to first. Yeah, Shea O'Leary, the ace of the staff, getting the start in game one at the tournament. And she's gonna look similar to Sandercock on the other side of things. Both have that go-to drop. She can sprinkle in a change-up rise ball as well. But for the most part, it's gonna pound the lower half of the zone and try and induce some ground balls for her defense. The junior will face Janai Kerr, Kaylee Mudge, Mac Leonard in the bottom of the first inning as the Knowles have started off perfect this year. And they are where everybody wants to be in the warm weather at the beginning of the season, hosting the Joanne Graff Classic last weekend. Started with a run rule victory against Mercer, picked up a pair of wins against Kennesaw State, top Loyola Chicago, and on Wednesday, beat South Alabama and opened things up yesterday, one of six games, with a 9-3 win against Tennessee. And if you watched that game, Kayla, as you did, you know that 9-3, yes, a very nice number. They put up five runs in the fourth inning. It was not the most defensively sound game, though. Yeah, Tennessee and Florida State combined for five errors in a single inning, and it got a little messy. But Florida State found a way to finish it out and get the W. As does O'Leary and Adabat against Kerr, getting it her chase low. Soft contact right back to the circle for the first out. So it's Mudge in the two spot, Mac Leonard, who drove in three yesterday, followed by Harding, Edenfield, Flaherty. Cheryl, who we just told you about hitting seventh, Bethany Keene, the transfer from South Florida. And then Sandercock. should say Blankenship in the number nine spot here as Mudge pokes that off to the right side for a base hit. Now, at number 13, Matt Leonard. Florida State got a big pickup in the offseason right here with Mac Leonard. Transfer from Illinois State has found a home in this lineup in the first week. Been so effective at the plate, has tons of pop, tons of power. Hits for well average. That ball tailed away on the throw from Ayakopo. Mudge to second is greenlit at third. She slides in ahead of the throw. One nothing Seminoles. things on this play. First of all, Mudge sees the ball in the dirt and she starts to go. Second of all, a bad throw from Iacobo behind the dish allows for Mudge to take an extra base, but she's so aggressive, she's so quick, has a really good read on it, able to score all the way on the errant throw. That's just quality base running right there, and that's something that a, Lani, a Coach Lonnie Alameda team takes so much pride in. They are disciplined base runners. They're also aggressive though in a sense that when they see something they react quickly they take it seriously 
and they work really hard on those skills. So it's a, it's a nice job of taking advantage of that big time error by Texas. And on the other side of things, if you are Texas, that's just something that can't happen. It's an errant throw first and foremost, but then you let one error lead to another because you don't get that ball quick enough and it ends up being a run for Florida State. It goes down as the third stolen base for Mudge, the error on Ayakopo, and to cap all of that in the at-bat for Leonard, she goes down on the first strikeout by O'Leary. Now batting number eight, Kate Hardy. And that throw from Ayakopo had some serious tail on it as well as Parker came over from short to try and grab it. That ball was already twisting toward right center field. Yeah, it wasn't a good throw. I also thought Parker could have made a little bit of a better effort on that. You're kind of surrendering the out at second base at that point, but go catch the ball. Make sure it doesn't get to the outfield so you don't let the runner advance. Bases empty, two down, Kaylee Harding. O'Leary behind 2-0 and oh on the sophomore out of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, who was all ACC third team last year. Drove in a team high 42 runs. You can see why with the great hitters, the great base running she's got in front of her in this lineup. Florida State this season picked to win the ACC for the ninth straight year. We talked about the Big 12 and how dominant in the polls Oklahoma has been at the top there. Florida State the same. That's in the air to left field. Cantu settles underneath, makes the catch, and the inning word on the young season. Look out for them in the SEC. They have turned a corner since last season, had such low home run numbers, only hit 22 on the entire year, and they're above 10 now. We're two weeks in, barely two weeks into the season. Mike Cousins, along with the three-time All-American, Kayla Bro. So we get settled in here for a top 10 matchup between Texas and Florida State. Three batters to the plate in the first against Sander Cock who allowed a single, but then quickly rebounded with a double play grounder to get out of the inning. And it's the powerful bat of Mary Iacopo, preseason all big 12 after last year, leading the Longhorns with 16 home runs. Iacopo puts a charge into it, out to left, and it eclipses Mudge as it takes a hop, and Iacopo is smoothly into second base on a laser-driven ball. Yeah, Iacopo, who is just pure power, smokes this ball. It's in her wheelhouse, this is a mistake, it's left belt high, and Kaylee Mudge out in left field just can't handle it. She's turned around a little bit. But those low, hard line drives are really tough to read in the outfield. But when in doubt, as an outfielder, it's always best to open up towards the line because if those balls are going to tail, they're going to tail towards the foul line. So just a bad first step for her and a double for Mary Iacopo. Two bags for the catcher. And it's Courtney Day. So in the blink of an eye, the Longhorns have the opportunity to tie things up here with just a base hit. Day lays down the bunt, looking to move Iacopo to third with nobody out, and now finds herself facing a two-strike count. As it pertains to the mechanics of outfield, Kayla, you know, if you're playing one game in a day, generally the conditions light-wise are not going to be 
all that different as you go throughout two hours, but today you're going to be, you know, if you're on the field at 10 a.m., it's going to be different than if you're out there at 4 p.m. And so you'll see certainly shades on the outfielders. What has been interesting to me so far with our first game of the day at 10 Eastern, is that's on the ground to Cheryl for the first out. Seeing two pitchers wearing sunglasses to start. Yeah, you know, the sun in Clearwater and on a day like this where it's a little bit overcast, it is so bright. It is really challenging, and we've already seen some mishaps happen on day one with the sun, whether it was a first baseman not being able to see a throw from third base because the sun's setting in her eyes, or an outfielder that can't catch a pop-up that loses it in the sun. It is tough conditions here, and you're right, it's going to change throughout the day. But the biggest rule of thumb is if you have something to put on your eyes, visor, sunglasses, you wear them. Because if you drop a ball and you're not wearing your gear, you're in trouble. Anybody who's ever gotten a sunburn on an overcast day knows that you're not kidding about how it can still be bright <laughs> without the sun necessarily being full force. Yeah. It's not sunny enough, though, yet for shades everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the angle of the sun, where you are, everything like that. But it's a tough task for the outfielders and infielders, for that matter, with balls in the air today. Sander Cock ahead, nothing and two on Jordan Whitaker. And gets a swing and a miss, strike three. That's her first strikeout. And is an out away from erasing the danger of Iacopo's leadoff double. Not only does Sandercock have really good, strong movement on the down ball, but she also throws really hard. She brings good velocity. So you can see right there, not only does Whitaker swing at a pitch that's outside of the zone, but she's a little bit late on it, just not ready to catch up to that speed. J.J. Smith right through the first offer. You see right there, there's that velocity again from Sandercock. Sophomore first baseman, two pitches, two strikes. It was a unanimous choice for the Big 12 All-Freshman team last year, hitting 319. 77 degrees. Humidity, 73%. Wind a little bit of a factor, but this is a phenomenal event. It has become a premier showcase, the early portion of the college softball schedule. And I suppose that the most difficult part that comes along with it after yesterday, where you had the games a little bit more partitioned off, is now all the fields are active today. And you, the hardest part is figuring out which game you want to watch. That's right. You got fan events, top 10, top 15 competitions left and right. I mean, it's a softball fan's dream. Sander Cock, three or rather four pitches to get the strike out there. Back-to-back -back Ks, and she leaves Iacopo a second. Catherine Sandercock doing such a good job, blowing it by these hitters, using her spin to get the out. Three of the last five postseasons, and she's been to the postseason just about every year. Yeah, every year that they've been there. I'll tell you what, you will not find perhaps around sports a more humble leader than Lonnie Alameda. She's such an incredible coach and you can tell how much her players first and foremost love her, how much they're willing to play for her. Uh, I mean, they lay it all on the line and it starts at the top with Kocha, they call her Kocha. And she's built a winning culture year after year. And, you know, no matter what they look like on the field, whether they're a power hitting team, a pitcher led team, whatever it may be, she just finds ways to get her team to buy into winning. And she creates a, a consistent culture every single year with her players. Edenfield on the ground and through into left for a base hit. A redshirt freshman catcher starts it off 
with a single off to left. She redshirted last year about an hour northwest of Tallahassee. And I agree with, with you, Kayla, of if you're around the program, you see that there is a, a, a certain atmosphere that is not one of, of pressure, but it's one of everybody playing for each other. There's Kocha. And there's an intensity, but it's not like it's a top-down intensity where there's the coach who's there to yell at you and get in your face and fire everybody up. And everybody's had somebody like that, whether it's been a boss or a coach at some point through your life. This is players doing it for each other because it starts when you walk in the door to beyond when you've graduated the program. Yeah, without a doubt. And you even mentioned Eden Edenfield and redshirting. I mean, Lonnie Alameda is one of the most consistent coaches in the country that red shirts players and she does it because she wants them to not only develop as a softball player but develop more as a person maybe they need an extra year to gain maturity to be the most successful person and player they can be so it's just little things like that that make her consistent and really loved by the players that go through her program and, you know, fun little story. I remember when they played in the World Series in 2018, we got to go watch their pre-championship series practice as part of the media. And I remember walking up, and she was so laid back. I couldn't believe it. I was like, you guys are playing a national championship game tonight? And they were just low-key being themselves, not trying to, like, make anything too big. Well, don't make the moment bigger than it has to be. And it works because they stayed true to who they are. And they won in 2018 against Washington. And, and that's always a big focus, is that she wants her team to develop their personality, their chemistry organically. She doesn't want to force anything amongst her team. So all part of her process, and man, she's successful at it. 3-2 to Flaherty. Back-to-back -back base hits for the Knowles. So they've got something working already, a 1-0 lead. And two aboard to start the second. A pick to top the ACC preseason poll once again this year, and by merit of what they've done. But when you talk about trying to win the ACC, it's not just Florida State. Throw Duke, throw Clemson into that conversation. Virginia Tech as well in what is a very competitive league. But Florida State finds itself as the front runner year in and year out. Yeah, it used to be Florida State, and that was pretty much it. But the ACC has made huge strides and has made a commitment to advancing softball as a sport. They go get Coach John Rittman to, help to start the Clemson program. They start the Duke program. Virginia Tech is stronger than it's ever been. So, I mean, kudos to the ACC for making each other stronger and better and making a commitment to improving their sport in that conference. Right, there's something to be said for a top-down commitment from an athletic department to say, yes, we do want to build those facilities. We do want to dedicate resources to programs that, in their case, has been exceedingly successful. And, uh, you know, as, as we're going to see this weekend, which is a huge weekend for women's sports on ABC and ESPN, you provide the platform. And the ratings will follow. The viewers are there. The bases are full of garnet and gold. Edenfield, Flaherty, Cheryl now with a single to bring up Bethany Keene. The runners at every base and nobody out. What a fantastic job by this Florida State lineup. They know what kind of pitcher that Shea O'Leary is. She's a down ball pitcher. So what do they do? They're trying to hit low, hard, pitches up the middle really fantastic barrel control a nice job not trying to do too much at the plate they're not trying to elevate they're trying to get nice simple base hits and here they are the bases loaded no outs and that's the strength of this florida state team so far this season is they've had plans at the plate and they're executing those plans and they've been able to do it in multiple ways. They've shown off a little bit of power, a little bit of speed, the base running from Kaylee Mudge early in this game. And now they're showing off the consistent, easy hitting of singles up the middle. This is Bethany Keene's spot in the lineup. Pinch hitter here is Hallie Waycaser, the redshirt freshman.
Yeah, and now that the bases are loaded, I think for Waycase are here, you got to think, I got to get the ball to the green. Whether it's a sack fly, something in the gap, something on the ground of the outfield, whatever it is, you get it on the green, you're most likely going to score a run. She's just down in front on that 2-1 pitch. Yeah, she was on it. Had the distance. A big moment early here for O'Leary with the bases loaded and already a one-run deficit. And that's a called third strike. Big pitch from O'Leary for a second strikeout. And she retires the first Seminole of the inning after three straight singles. Yeah, she went inside, inside, inside. And then, boom, drop ball in the outside corner to freeze up Waycaser. Number nine hitter, Brooke Blankenship. Trying to add to the tally for a Florida State team that has come out of the gates perfect. The Seminoles have not been shy to swing at O'Leary's offerings. To speak something into existence as well. So you talked about the culture with Florida State. They have a coach's podcast. Or maybe I should say they had a coach's podcast. I don't want to put it in the past tense. It's called Coaches with Coffee. The FSU softball podcast. Coaches and coffee, excuse me. But the last episode, this was a constant a couple years ago. The last episode that I see was published April 13th of 2021. Know the, the pandemic threw a wrench into everybody's schedules, but I can't be the only one clamoring for that to come back. That sounds like they need to fire it back up. <laughs> <laughs> because there may be another staff out there that does a podcast. I'm not aware of it. Let me know if, <laughs> if there is one, but to have your head coach and, and assistants just chopping it up and then throwing that out there for us to gladly consume, ready for it. 2-2, two, two, up and away to see if Blankenship would chase. And O'Leary is in need of a strike. Enfield Flaherty, Cheryl on the base pass. FSU in its first game of the weekend put up a big tally against number 15 Tennessee yesterday. They won nine to three. Eighth pitch to Blankenship is inside ball four. O'Leary walks in a run as Edenfield touches home and it's two nothing FSU. It's a nice AB by the freshman right there. Just having a very mature at bat. Fouling off the pitches she needs to and having a disciplined eye. And that's so tough early in the season. You got bases loaded. You want to be that RBI producer. But to stay within yourself and make sure you swing at good pitches is so important. 
and you'll take the walk to pick up a run. They haven't necessarily scored in conventional fashion, but in a top 10 matchup, you take the runs any way you can get them. Kerr waves at a ball on the dirt. One ball and one strike. As the on-deck hitter, Kaylee Mudge, single, stole second, took on home on a two-base throwing error by the catcher, Iacopo. And there the bases loaded walk. Late on the 2-0, snap throw down to third, and they caught Flaherty leaning off the bag. That's a big time play right there by Mary Iacopo. Florida State has all the momentum in the world. Your pitcher's struggling a little bit to throw strikes. So you pick her up by getting a huge pickoff at third base and just catching Flaherty, just going way too hard off the base. And there's no reason to do that even better. Yeah, put that in the Sandcastle Museum and Hall of Fame, which if it doesn't exist, uh, we now have our initial entrant to the Sandcastle and Museum Hall of Fame. Yeah, get that picture for your Insta. <laughs> well, it was a potentially huge bottom of the second for Florida State, but with some great defense and pitching, Shea O'Leary and Mary Iacopo helped them get out of trouble, limiting Florida State to just one run. Meanwhile, Sandra Cock picked up back-to-back -back strikeouts against the Longhorns in the second. She's allowed one base hit in each of the first two innings, but no Longhorn has gone past second. Pitch to Cantu. It's a called strike. Sander Cock thought it was a strikeout. And a look on to first. Alex Leet, the umpire, says no swing. So it goes one and two. Cantu, the former Texas Tech Red Raider, started out her career there. Second year at Texas, got just 15 starts a year ago. Their left fielder leading things off in the third with Texas down a pair. Slow chopper on one hop is easily taken care of for the out. And then number six, Sunday afternoon, ABC. There's going to be a special edition of College Game Day, and that takes us to this matchup. Tennessee and South Carolina with the Gamecocks, the head of the class in the SEC at 12-1. and 1. 
Look out for Aaliyah Boston, one of the best post players in the country there on Dawn Staley's squad. South Carolina, Tennessee. Coverage starts 1 Eastern. You can watch that on the ESPN app as well. It's something we heard from Coach White in these preseason calls was that this is one of the deepest teams that he's ever fielded at Texas, and he just feels the depth is there. And Bell Dayton's a great example of this, as somebody that's working her way into the lineup, playing in center field. They have options on the bench, fighting, having quality competition for starting positions. And that's what's so cool about playing in a really good tournament like this, is you get the opportunity to play against quality pitching and see who's the who's the gamer on your team, who maybe doesn't show something in practice, but when the lights are on and you put them between those white lines and they're facing an opponent in a different jersey, they just shine a little bit brighter. You can give some players some roles on your team that way. Well, and with Dayton too here, the transfer from Arizona where she played a couple of years, she got into 64 games. Started in the outfield in their opener in the Women's College World Series and only started a handful of games last year, but clearly somebody by where she came from has been on a big stage before and is ready for that competition. Two one and that plunks down in front of Harding in right field. Third base hit for the Longhorns. See if they can make anything of it. Yeah, no, you make a great point in how impactful transfers have been in the college softball world the last couple of years. But Texas went into the transfer portal and got some game changers for their program. And we're seeing Shea O'Leary in the circle today for Texas. But Haley Dolcini, the transfer from Fresno State, might be one of the biggest impact transfers of the year. She's a big time strikeout pitcher brings the rise ball to the game, and he's really excited to have her on the staff. Dulcini's one of those pitchers where when you look at the national leaderboards in certain stats, in her case, strikeouts, she had 259 in 180 innings last year. You go, man, I would love to see more of that player. And she moves herself into a power conference coming from the Mountain West with Fresno State and has a great opportunity. She was the Mountain West Pitcher of the Year last year. Yeah, and that is the beauty, is that there's a place and a position for everybody, and the transfer portal opens it up for players to grow, to maybe expand their reach, to play at a higher level if necessary, if they're fit to. And Haley Lee Dolcini is a great example, has a year left to go try something new and really challenge herself in a power five. Sander Cock retired Jefferson quickly to start things off on a fly ball out to left. And now falls behind three and one. With Dayton sprinting from first to second, Flaherty didn't handle it cleanly, but did succeed in keeping it in front of her and keeping Jefferson from the base pass for a second time. So there are two away, a runner in scoring position now for Scott. Coach Alameda to the circle with Scott coming up. A bit of an unknown, right? Because she only made her debut on Wednesday against McNeese State. They do know she's a difficult out, and she singled her first time up against Sandercock. Yeah, she's one of those players that is a dual threat in the sense that she can show off the speed. She could lay down a drag bunt, but she also has a little bit of pop in her bat. So really challenging for the defense position against her. 
but that's what you love is someone that is versatile that can do a lot of different things and really put pressure on the defense to make a decision or put pressure on an opposing pitcher to come up with a good game plan because you, know, you have somebody that can do multiple things the game the game plan or the pitching plan can change depending on what they're doing are they bunting and slapping or are they hitting away Starter with a strike. <laughs> Top 25 recruit coming into Texas. Sends that down the line to left. Mudge is over to track it down three times in the first three innings. The Longhorns have put a runner on base. I'm sure you've got no favorite in that game. <laughs> no, definitely not. She's Kayla Bro, the 2012 national champion at Alabama. My cousin's along with you. Bottom of the third, Florida State with a 2-0 lead over Texas with one in the first and another in the second. Texas next weekend will be at home hosting the Texas Classic. As they invite in Texas State, UTSA, among others. And they're on the road here early in the season. You'll remember last year, weather really impacted their schedule to get things going. So to be in warm weather is a welcome change. Although you think February in Austin, you're in pretty good shape, but can never predict the inclement weather. So Mudge, who recorded the final out in the top of the third, here starts off the third as she takes first and brings up Mac Leonard. And uh, talking to Coach White, I mean, he, he said it, iron sharpens iron is the mentality when they go face a tough schedule like they are facing this season. They know they're gonna have to play the best you know, last season they ended up losing to Oklahoma State in Super Regionals, and I know that they're disappointed in that result. And we're a game away from potentially making it back to OKC. So how can you strengthen this team with some newcomers sprinkled in to really fortify yourself for a postseason run? And he feels like a tough schedule is the way to do it. Wild pitch allows Mudge second base. And it brings up the, the mantra that a lot of players take on this year. One more. If you can do one more thing, like you said, of, of being right on the doorstep, of being able to get where you want to be, you think about it today. It's February 18th, the second weekend of the season. You're trying to be playing in June. Is the one thing that I need to do going to happen today? Is it going to be in April? Is it going to be the end of May? It's got to be every time. Yeah, no doubt. And the mentality, too, is that, you know, this season is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You can't give everything you've got at the very beginning of the season and then take some time off. You got to really take everything one day at a time, bring everything you have every single day, not look too far ahead because it's a long season. And that's one of the biggest challenges is to not overlook opponents, to make sure that you stay sharp, to make sure you stay consistent in your routines, your practice, the level that you bring it. Because if you don't, then you can get caught off guard and you get upset. Or you can't go on the road and upset somebody. Leonard on a sinking liner that gets under Cantu's glove. Mudge had to wait for the ball to drop. She scampers home. 3-0 Seminoles. Mac Leonard showing why she's a good hitter. This is a ball down low. She makes a great adjustment, drops her barrel completely, just finds a gap out in the outfield. But again, that's barrel control. She knows that ball's low in the zone. Make sure she squares it up enough to score much. But the reason that this play happens is because there's two pass balls and Mudge is able to get from first to third. 
And, and those are mistakes that you just can't have as a pitcher. And those will hurt you for sure. And uh, no surprise here that because of mistakes like that, Mike White considering a pitching change. O'Leary with Florida State taking a 3-0 lead. Yeah, Hewlin is another transfer hitting the Texas roster this season. That's off the glove of Parker at shortstop. Stays on the infield. Leonard over to third. And it has not been one concussive blow from Florida State. They've just been chipping away at the Longhorns. Yeah, you can see right here a little jam shot by Harding that's able to sneak by Kenzie Parker at shortstop. But those are the kind of hits you'll take in this game. Anything to pass the bat down, especially with no outs. Edenfield single didn't score last inning. After the infield single, ball and a strike with nobody out. That's given a ride deep in the air to left center field. Goodbye. The long ball for Edenfield. There's the big shot for FSU. Six nothing Seminoles. Well, this is a pitch that's just a mistake. Plain and simple. It's over the heart of the plate. And Edenfield gets all of this ball. It's a no-doubter. You knew it right off the bat. Hewlin supplied the location and the velocity, and Edenfield just had to get her barrel there. Sometimes it's the sound of the ball meeting the bat. Sometimes it's just the crowd's reaction to it, and it seemed like everybody at this field knew that one was gone off the bat here as Flaherty comes to the plate now with nobody out. Yeah, that was a shot. And these bleachers started filling up like two hours beforehand. You see the trolley that can take you from field to field in the background as well? I mean, this tournament's sold out. I, this is the best show in softball in February. Flaherty had a single her first time up. And she is now two for two. There's just no antidote to stop this offense right now. Yeah, Florida State right now, just such a hot hitting team. You know, and after their impressive run last year and last year's season, to be quite honest, their yeah. offense was not what got them to the Women's College World Series. It was their pitching, their defense, and their scrappy base running. But the offense just didn't produce as much throughout the regular season. That's why they didn't win the ACC. They didn't win the ACC tournament. But down the stretch, they just started getting streaky and they got hot at the right time. But right now, this looks like a well-developed, well-rounded offense that has a little bit of everything, a little bit of power. They can hit for average. They can uh, hit productive, like productive hitting base to base. They can short game it. And a big key, too, that I look at is Sydney Sherrill, who is one of the best hitters in this lineup, really hasn't done much this year, and they're still crushing it. If she gets hot, watch out. They could be one of the best offenses in the country, hands down. She was preseason all ACC, singled her first time up. That's a dart up the middle. Flaherty up to second. 
as Jefferson came across from second to just get in front of that ball. And just taking a look at her leg there after running through the back. Or perhaps her knee. That's one of those kind of very unique plays where something tweaks when you're trying to get out of the box. You get stuck, your cleat gets stuck in the dirt. You kind of pivot weird, whatever it may be, you just kind of struggle. And Sydney Sherrill looks to be in a lot of pain and hope that she's all right because she's a, a player that you love to watch and been enjoying watching her over the last four years. Wish a quick recovery for Cheryl, who has been one of the brightest stars, not only in this program, but in the ACC as well. So she goes back to the dugout as she's spelled by Christina Hartley, the freshman out of St. Petersburg, Florida. Pinch runner here with runners at first and second. Florida State has scored four of its six runs here in the inning. Still nobody out. And it's Wade Kaser who came in, pinch hit in the second. She stayed in as the DP. So yet another offensive surge from Florida State, although let it be no surprise if you watched them play yesterday. They scored five of their nine runs against Tennessee all in a single inning. And it's a team that Granted, here we are. We're excited about the beginning of the season, but it also means limited sample size. They're hitting 400 as a team in just a handful of games. Yeah, I think what's impressive is just one through nine, they've been really successful this season, and that's why their team batting average is so high. It's not just one or two people that are doing it. It's their whole lineup. Oh, 2 and that ends a string of five straight base hits to begin the inning, including a pitching change. And Waycaser is the first Seminole retired in the last of the third. Blankenship completes the second full trip through the order for FSU here. Blankenship, a freshman that was competing when we talked to Coach Alani Alameda, was competing for a, a shortstop position with Josie Muffley. And they might go back and forth, but credit to the freshman for competing to try and earn herself a starting spot. Muffley's a, an awesome athlete, though. Mm -hmm. No doubt. She That's came why onto it's the so scene with, with that, I think it was that game against Memphis, uh, where she made the a leaping catch coming over uh, on a throw down from home plate, and then made the tag between her legs. Yeah, no doubt, phenomenal athlete. She actually made a play on a foul ball earlier in this game, behind the fence in the dugout. Just ready at every opportunity. That's right. Seventh game of the year. FSU looking to stay perfect. Slow roller. Jefferson gets the easy out over at first base. But the Knowles have runners now at second and third. So real-time update, by the way. 
again for stats that may or may not mean much. That's going to be our element of the weekend. Stat that may or may not mean something later on in the year is that they're hitting 418 as a team. So uh, harbinger of things to come, maybe, but certainly something to be excited about for that club. It's Kerr, batter number nine of the third frame. She's yet to reach base. Having softly hit back to the circle and struck out her last time up. And as it happens, she's just one of two in the lineup who have not reached so far as the Knowles have not gone down one, two, three. On the offensive side here, what do you think the conversation is like for FSU? Yeah, I think they're relaying at this point what Hewlin's throwing, just kind of saying, hey, here's what we're seeing, here's what to look for, whatever it may be. And, and to keep it in a light and loose, what they're doing is working. And that's what's cool about an offense when you are clicking and you feel like you're just passing the bat down consistently. It's a lot of fun and you enjoy it and it kind of gives you a hunger to keep it going and to not be the one to, oh, I'm going to be the out or I'm going to get the second out of the inning, whatever it may be. So. Honestly, they're probably just having a good time. Keeping it simple. Relaying information and getting ready to try and score two more runs. A pressure, but like a good pressure? Yeah, in a good way. You know, hitting is contagious and it goes both ways, positively and negatively. Seminoles are definitely in the positive camp right now. Kerr lays off three and one. Yeah, I'd say they're keeping it light. Yeah, and that's who Florida <laughs> State is, right? Saw some good moves there in the dugout from <laughs> Daniel Watson, who was the starting pitcher in their win against Tennessee. And I don't know pound for pound which sport has the most stars on TikTok, but softball's got to be up there in terms of, you know, I got 500,000, 600,000 followers. Not me. Yeah, some there's, the stars some, <laughs> there's some superstar TikTokers out there. 3-2, it's flared to the outfield, a diving try by Dayton, and that rolls all the way to the wall. The onslaught continues from Florida State. They had six straight reach to start the inning, and they've turned it into a six-run inning. Eight nothing. Uh, interesting in Kerr's at bat. She got rung up, not rung up, but her last pitch before that hit was a, a strike called, and I thought it was a ball, and it would have been ball four. And I think she was a little bit frustrated. And the best way to answer a bad call from the ump like that is to go out and get a base hit on the next swing. And she does that. You know what? If I can't get a walk, fine. I'll go push two runs across the board for my team with a hit. I like that. You feel like you, again, get a bad call. So what? Next pitch. Boom. Two RBIs. The adaptability turns it into a two-run double. And here is the Seminole who started it all in the third. Kaylee Mudge drew a walk. So her second plate appearance of the inning, and she's down 0-2 on just two pitches.
Mudge walked, Leonard doubled, and that's where the pitching change occurred. And the 0-2 on the outside, corner strike three. The long inning for the Longhorns is over, but the gap has been what? Texas and Florida State. I'm Mike Cousins along with Caleb Bro. And so far, it's the Seminoles doing what they did offensively yesterday as they dropped a nine spot on Tennessee in their Clearwater opener. And here, as the Longhorns come to the plate in the fourth, it's an eight nothing advantage for Sander Cock and company. I can tell you right now, just watching this Florida State team, I'm so impressed. They really look like a complete team right now. That says a lot early in the season because a lot of times it takes months, tons of games to develop your team, but coaches got them firing on all cylinders. And you know, just for anybody that's wondering out there, Sydney Sherrill did make it out to third base for defense, which is a really great sign. Glad to see that after Cheryl twisted her leg trying to exit the batter's box and run to first and left the field in what appeared to be a good deal of pain based on her facial expression. But to have her back out there is an excellent sign for this team picked atop the ACC. So I'm curious, Kayla, with, with what you were talking about, you know, the well-oiled machine, they're hitting better than 400 here. They sent six straight batters to the plate last inning to start off that frame. How is it, you know, we talked about the culture, how is it that a team comes out of the gates playing this good? Uh, well, something we heard from Coach was that the upperclassmen have done such a good job of getting the underclassmen to buy in. They're such a team that works on the little things. They want to be elite base runners. They want to be elite situational hitters. So when you can have a team buy into those little things, sometimes the big moments take care of, of themselves. So I think from a cultural perspective, they're just doing the right things probably every single day, top to bottom, accountability, ownership in their day-to-day -day actions that leads to the performance on the field. And then beyond that, I think they've got a really good recruiting class. They've had top recruiting classes in the last few years. So talent meets discipline, and you get a really, really good quality uh, team on the field. So far, a perfect record to show for it. Sander Cock, who waited her time to become a number one at Florida State, working behind Megan King for a couple of years. Helping lead them to that national championship a few years ago. And as close as they could get in 2021. Two and two on Parker, the shortstop, leading it off. She battles away another offering from Sandercock. Yeah, Sandercock Sander made a name for herself with the Women's College World Series last year. Florida State was a team that really nobody expected to get there. Like we mentioned before, just didn't win the ACC, didn't win the ACC tournament, had trended down towards the end of the year. And then all of a sudden, they win their regional. They go to Baton Rouge, beat LSU on the road in Super to get to punch their ticket. They drop game one at the World Series. So they have to play the max amount of games to get back to the champ series, including beating Alabama and Montana Fouts, not once, but twice to get there. Then they beat Oklahoma in game one and were six outs away from a national championship. And the Oklahoma Sooners offense was just too much. You talk about that journey. 
can give a lot of confidence to a pitcher like Sander Cock. Long run to grab it. No problem. All smiles for Blank and Chip tracking that one toward the line for the first out. Now batting for Texas, number 33, Mary Mary Iacopo, a central part of this Texas program. She talked to the Austin American statesman, and I, I found this to be very relatable that uh, her dog, Brindle Staffordshire, has been great for her as a, uh, as a, a nap buddy, but also just for her mental health. And she gives that one a ride out toward right field. Mary Iacopo has the Longhorns on the board. The solo dinger, 8-1 to one for the Longhorns backstop. Mary Iacopo, one of those hitters that's just pure power. You're down 8 to nothing. probably a little bit frustrated. She makes sure that she takes advantage of her at bat right here, gets a ball elevated in the zone. This is a mistake by Sander Cock, and she does not miss. Really nice swing, tons of explosion on her back hip, and lets this one drive well beyond the center field fence. Courtney Day swinging, Blankenship diving. Her throw to first is just tardy. What a great effort by the young shortstop, though. Slow roller a little bit up the middle. She's showing off her range, snags this. Just doesn't quite have the quickness or the arm strength to get that one in time from her knees. What a tough play, but a great effort. And it goes down as an infield single. Longhorns will pinch run with Day aboard. On uh, the infield single. Luke Gilbert is the pinch runner. Whitaker down 0-1. Down the left field line. Mudge is over for a look. And just runs out of room. Oh, Kayla, you and I in our first game saw a near no-hitter between Oklahoma State and Michigan. And for the Wolverines, they didn't collect their first hit until the top of the seventh inning. But once that first hit came, just a blue double, get things going. The offense started to spark a little bit there. Perhaps that can be the case here for the Longhorns with Iacopo's first home run. But in response, Sander Cock strikes out Whitaker for the second time. Yeah, it's those moments that when you're down eight, nothing, your back's against the wall. Sometimes somebody needs to spark something and Mary Iacopo is Probably a little bit pissed off and frustrated that they're down eight to nothing. And for some people that like to fire and it makes them have a really good at bat, she goes out and hits a home run. Texas has got a long way to go, but I can tell you right now, every little bit matters. Piecing together some hits, trying to make something happen can help gain momentum, maybe not for this game, but for the next game. Pinch hitter Lauren Burke. She steps into the number seven spot here where J.J. Smith struck out in the second inning.
Burke has been a presence after starting her career at Oregon in 2018. All freshman team in the Pac-12. Last year hit 302 as a regular starter, but here can't catch up to what Sander Cock is dealing. Four strikeouts for the... You know, the difference between, you know, throwing your pitches and but trying to beat a batter. You know, you're going competition. You're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a hitter that wants to succeed as much as you do. So how can you find ways to win each battle, each pitch, whatever it may be, and focusing on that element rather than trying to be perfect and have, like, the perfect location or the perfect spin, but just going out and competing with someone. I think that's powerful. And I looked at it from, you know, the side of a hitter. I loved going out and saying, I'm going to do whatever I can to beat you, pitcher in the circle. I'm better than you today on this pitch during this at bat. Because I, I always so find it funny, right? Like, no, it's the old it. yeah. athletic cliche of, well, we just wanted it more. But you think the other people didn't want it? It's got to come yeah. down to something different, right? Yeah. No, without a doubt. I think there's so many little things that add up to that competitive nature. You know, whether it's confidence, whether it's your preparation, how you feel that day, whatever it may be, adds to the, you know, the quote unquote, like wanting it more. But I think uh, at the end of the day, that there's some people that just have another switch that they can turn on and they can be more competitive and can battle a little bit harder, can be more present than your opponent. I think that goes a long way. Healing with a 2-1 to Leonard leading off for Florida State. It's 2-2. Two two. While we're breaking down cliches, let me get your take on another one. <laughs> Is momentum in sports a thing? Oh, I think it's totally a thing. I say it all the time. I think it's a huge thing, especially in softball. It's a give and take. There's times where there's this intangible feeling that you can get where you can sense somebody's starting to break somebody's starting to fold um, and I think that's a big deal and kind of mentioned hitting is contagious you can feel sometimes when your team is on it when everybody's seeing the ball well and you just want to pass the bat down it's real I, I don't know I can't <laughs> you can't see it but you can feel it <laughs> see where the way I look at momentum is Everybody on the field is good, but you don't play your best all the time, right? So oh, yeah. when, when yeah. the Seminoles in the third inning had six straight players come up, had a three-run home run in there, that was them at their best. But then yeah. there's you might say that they could have a, a one, two, three inning here as Leonard is retired leading off the inning. It's an ebb and a flow. So we may be in, in, yeah. uh, in concurrence on that, right? There are ebbs and flows. Ebbs and flows, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's so I guess we have two different ways of looking at it. It's a, a rise and a fall of peak performance. Look at you. We got our oh, first chapter right of our book here. written already. Yes, we do. <laughs> Cuz and Bros Sports Psychology Handbook, Volume One. <laughs> Kaylee Harding is the batter with the bases clear. All right, I'm going to give you another situation where I think momentum or that feeling comes into play. I think there's times in sport where you see a teammate do something and it inspires you to do something as well. And I think that happens. I, I've had moments in my playing career where, you know, we're down two or three runs and we've had four bad innings where we're not getting any kind of offensive production. And somebody comes and hits a shot out to center field. And all of a sudden, you just feel this surge of energy. Oh, man, if she can do it, I can do it. And then you try and ride and take that momentum and carry it with you. And I've seen that work, too, where somebody else inspires you to elevate your game and your play. And I'm curious to know, like, here's a 2-0 pitch. Who was that for you? Oh, there's so many players. I mean, it changed all the time, but there are so many players. Um, you know, whether it's Jackie Trana coming up with a huge strikeout after giving up a couple walks or something like that, or um, one of my teammates, Amanda Locke, would just hit these moonshot home runs. Uh, that was just would fire you up. Uh, I played with Haley McClenney, who's on the national team. 
You know, she was really, really good when we were kind of struggling. She found a way to get on base and she would get fired up. That was powerful too. So, so many. I have so many great teammates that inspired me. It was awesome. I can just hear the smile in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> So it's ball four to Harding, and that brings up Edenfield, who's had the biggest swing of the day so far, her last time up in the third. Yep, when you get a pitch that's this over the plate, you are a happy camper as a hitter, and she takes advantage because <laughs> that one was right in her wheelhouse. We're going to get our second pitching change of the day here from Texas, and we're going to see Estelle Check, who comes over from NC State. So it was O'Leary to start Hewlin, and now Check. Yeah, a Check, a, another new addition to the Texas Longhorn pitching staff that looks completely different, completely different staff than it was in 2021. And, She's gonna bring a different look, a little lefty movement. She's gonna work that curveball pretty often. She'll throw out three different speeds. Definitely her focus is spin though. She's not gonna blow it by anybody, doesn't have a ton of velocity, but when you're a spinning pitcher, you wanna keep hitters off balance and you wanna induce miss hit balls, easy pop-ups, ground balls. Well, a couple of offensive chess moves as well from Florida State. Kyle Lepresti in to hit here for Edenfield in the number five spot. And that allows some movement on the base paths as the Knowles went to a pinch runner, Autumn Belvey, to run for Harding. A wild pitch allows her to take second. Critical runner at second base for Florida State. Could put them back up by the eight run threshold. Another ball in the dirt. Couple more free bases. How good Florida State's been hitting. You don't need to give them any free passes and it's been an Achilles heel of Texas all day today. Just too many balls in the dirt pass balls, mistakes, to so allow them to advance on the base pass. Ooh, talk about an off-speed right there. Had a little Presti way out in front. But I think that's something that Texas can take back to the drawing board and say, we need to clean up these things. Makes it harder on everybody, makes it harder on the defense to make plays behind you. More room for mistakes and errors. And that was a, a, something that Mike White talked about. He said, you know, last year we set records offensively, so we really had to look at our pitching staff as one of our weaknesses and where we can make improvements to try and make a run to OKC. He's, he owned that, and I think that's very powerful, is recognizing where you need to make improvements and then going to work. They added Haley Dolcini, the Mountain West player, pitcher of the year from Fresno State. Hewlin from Houston, Check from NC State, which was a team that had a lot of offensive firepower last year in the ACC. Devin Flaherty, already two for two with a couple of singles. Our third plate appearance. 8-1 Florida State. They scored one in the first, one in the second, and then six in the third to build their formidable advantage. The 
the opportunity for a patient approach by FSU, knowing the scoreboard is in their favor. That's high in the air, out toward left. Bellevue is across to score a crucial run. That puts even more pressure on Texas, nine to one on the sacrifice fly by Flaherty. Flaherty does a really good job of understanding situationally. All she needs to do is hit something deep enough to allow for the sack fly and score. And she does exactly that. Well, great to see Cheryl not only taking her spot at third, but back in the batter's box as well. And an awkward exit to the left-hand batter's box her last time up. As she twisted her knee, she came out of the box, was grimacing in pain as she went to the dugout. And she's down 0-2 here. Yeah, so happy to see Sydney Cheryl back. She's just one of those talented players that she loves to watch, plays the game the right way. She rips that foul up the first baseline. Yeah, she's the last player on this Florida State team that was a starter when they won their World, World Series championship in 2018. So she brings that leadership to this team. The understanding she knows what it's like to win, what it takes. And they got so close last year. But she knows. And their run scoring has been really impressive. Their first six games, all wins, averaging eight runs a game. But their first five games was not against power conference competition. They put up a big number yesterday, nine against Tennessee. St. Pete Clearwater Elite Invitational, presented by Wilson, is brought to you by Visit St. Pete Clearwater, Florida and Wilson Fast Pitch, leaders in softball innovation. A top 10 showdown on the diamond that has tilted all of Florida State, and now it's time for our game track brought to us, Caleb Rowe by Wilson. Yeah, it's been all Florida State in this ball game. I mean, 10 hits, nine runs. They've been so clutch, and it's everything. It's the situational hitting, it's the power numbers. It's all there. And they've capitalized on some big mistakes by the Texas pitching staff. And, and they had to use three pitchers, and none have been able to really solve the equation of this Florida State offense. So pressure is on with an eight-run lead to put some offense on the board for the Longhorns here. And that's a way to get things started with the ball right back up the middle for a leadoff single to get things going for Texas. A nice hit from Alyssa Washington. Now batting number six, Bellamy. Sander Cock trying to make it a complete game. So you can get three outs without a run crossing home plate here now after she pitched an inning in relief yesterday and their win against Tennessee. Roller to the right side on a running try. Flaherty gets the first out. Washington to second. Just off the end of the bat right there by Dayton. This is a nice job by Flaherty over at first. And Dayton thinks she's going to be safe at first. It's a tight play, so close. There probably won't be very many games this year 
where Janae Jefferson goes without a hit, but Sandra Cock will try and make this one of them as she's gotten her on the first two times up. Yeah, she's such an incredibly tough out. It's because she's got speed first and foremost, so she can turn what would be outs for the majority of players across the country into base hits. Coach White calls her a robot. She's so consistent. It's really cool to see her. She's going to be on Team USA, made the national team. Really outstanding career for her. She's just one of those players that you can't take your eyes off of. That team will compete this summer in the World Games. Jefferson, the program leader in batting average, also the best in Big 12 career history coming into the season, along with the number of total hits as well. And that's how you end up as a first team All-America selection per Softball America. So a crucial runner at second with Texas trying to avoid a run rule defeat. Right back to the circle. Sandercock has the Knowles within and out of their seventh victory of the year. Sandra Cock helping herself out, but she's been so efficient today. Her pitch count only at 65, and it's such a benefit if she's able to close out this final out to do the run rule, to have a run rule in effect. You get a little bit more rest, you keep your pitch count low. It's a long season. That could mean huge health implica implications down the road towards the end of the season. Sander Cock, the senior in the circle against Mia Scott. Just the second game of her college career. <laughs> Scott won a state title on the Longhorns home field in Austin. Now wearing the white and burnt orange. One and one and a base hit could well keep them alive. But now Texas down to its final strike here in their first game of the day. And they've got Auburn waiting right around the corner with a 4 p.m. first pitch. Sander Cock with a 1-2, wasted off. Relatively speaking, a little bit more of a quiet day for Florida State. They're done after this game today. They'll see Michigan tomorrow before playing two on Sunday including the gem against UCLA to cap it all off. One, two, straight down, just staying alive. It's going to be awesome to see UCLA, Florida State going head-to-head -head on ESPN primetime. Two national championships in the last three years of play in 2018-2019. I told all of my, my staff, my personal assistant, my driver, my butler, I said, clear my schedule. <laughs> Sunday night is mine, ESPN, 7 Eastern. And then I woke up from my dream and I said, oh, you know yeah. what? I'm going to clear my own schedule. Yeah. <laughs> 7 Eastern. Park yourself on the couch, pop some popcorn, and enjoy. One, two is lined down for a base hit into left field. Mudge is up with it. She has no play at home, and the Longhorns have life. It's nine to two as Mia Scott collects an RBI single. Been really impressed with Mia Scott today. She's been a bright spot for this Texas lineup today. Had a really good at bat when she faced 
Sander Cock in the first inning, and again right there, just battling. And backs against the wall, pushing for the game to extend as much as you can as your hitter, and she does that. I think we're going to be seeing Mia Scott as a staple in the lineup moving forward. Mike White said after what she did Wednesday against McNeese State that she's just a younger version of, of Janae Jefferson and her ability to hit. She had two triples, her ability to run the base paths, and basically just to wreak havoc for the opposition. It's a really high praise when you sit there and say that she's like Janae Jefferson because Jan Janae Jefferson's gonna go down as one of the best hitters in a Texas uniform. So to be in the same realm as her is a big deal. Texas getting its runs on a Mary Iacopo fourth inning solo home run. Mia Scott with the RBI single here top five. Parker trying to hit with two strikes. Skies it to center for Kerr. And the inning is over. But the Longhorns stave off defeat. We'll go bottom five. Florida State up a touchdown and the extra. Can you believe, Kayla, that it's coming up on a decade? from the, the 2012 championship team you were on? Yeah, it's wild. It, it seems like it was yesterday, but it also feels like it's a really long time ago. Uh, but we're gonna celebrate the 10 year this season at the Rhodes House, so excited for that. But really excited for that Sunday night game. UCLA has some very talented players, and I think it's gonna be a good matchup for Florida State, who's looking offensively as good as anybody in the country. But they've got Megan Faremo in the circle. They have some potent hitters in their lineup, like Maya Brady, Aaliyah Jordan, Bree Perez. Tons of Women's College World Series experience as well, so they're a team that definitely has its sights set on OKC. It's really astonishing how 10 years can just fly by like you said like it feels you blink your eye here's bethany Keene, who was pinch hit for and reinserted into the lineup earlier on transfer from usf especially these last couple of years where how many times did you say like was that in 2020 or was that eight <laughs> years ago I don't, <laughs> I don't know the twilight zone the last two years <laughs> Keen sends that up and away. Another transfer player for this club. She started all 190 games of her career at USF for Ken Erickson, a 272 hitter there. But growing up, she grew up in this area, Bradenton, Florida. And when she was a kid, she would go to softball camps at Florida State. She's the first out here, bottom five. That's the other pretty unique thing that we're going to see from the transfer portal is some players that didn't have a chance at their dream school, maybe the first time around, getting recruited straight out of high school, but prove their worth in college, have a couple good years, and then get an opportunity to go suit up for the school of their dreams. And it's really cool when it aligns with a positional need for that school as well. <laughs> no doubt. I think there's definitely some good and bad sides to the transfer portal, but I think you're going to see a lot of teams be able to fill the gaps where they otherwise wouldn't have to prevent some maybe off years or off seasons. So we don't have a pitcher, we don't have a catcher this season. Uh, we might have to rebuild, but that's not going to be the case anymore. And on the other side of things, coaches are going to have to work really hard to recruit their kids that are already there to keep their kids in the program to make sure that they do a good job day in and day out of beating an athlete. Is there something to be said for going through a situation that 
you know, it's just, it's perhaps not adversity, but like, you know, you're not finding the right spot because there's, there's a difference, right, between having to battle for your position versus a school just not being the right fit, which is probably a hard line to define sometimes, right? No doubt. That's a really great question because you have certain certain circumstances where you're right it's not a good fit you don't fit into the style of play uh, the coaching style the university the town the city whatever it just doesn't fit after you've been there for a, an amount of time and it's time to go try something different where you may flourish from a certain coaching style second roller of the inning over for jefferson two down and then there's other circumstances circumstances where maybe selfishness comes into play and you're not getting to play the position you want and you want out. And that's, like you said, there's a big distinction between those two, two realms of thought. And I think there's a balance and I, I'm definitely in the camp that you should compete and fight for spots if you want them. And I also believe in the power of being a role player and doing your job whether it's a pinch runner, whether it's on the bench, whether it's pushing somebody in front of you as a starter. And as is the case with a, a lot of major changes, sporting or not, the initial resistance usually tends to be full of hyperbole. <laughs> and so everybody, not everybody, I'm saying the, the, the public in general, there's an outcry of this could ruin sports as we know it in college sports. Yeah. And, I, I, anything that empowers the athlete to be able to take control of their destiny, you know, normally you'd have four or five years. Now you have some six-year players, whether it was throwing in a red shirt and then a, an additional year of eligibility due to COVID. Why not maximize that opportunity? Make it as good as it can be and make it a great college experience. It's been a good experience for Florida State today. Up seven. Into the world of being the number one pitcher on your staff. No more Rachel Garcia. It's a different world, and she's poised to take over. Liner to short. And what else would you expect from Josie Muffley except for phenomenal athleticism to be able to launch like she's coming off of a trampoline and make a catch? Yeah, getting up, getting that ball. I mean, that's what Muffley does, right? So athletic, showing off the her vertical is that what you call how high you can jump your vertical <laughs> yeah yeah she started every game at shortstop last year you know, we talked about it earlier is about this time last year that leaping between the legs tag against memphis the transfer from tulsa by way of portage michigan now in her third year playing for lani alameda I mean, she just shows off the athleticism, but you know what? When you talk about like making plays like that and jumping and getting in there, it's timing, it's reading the ball off the bat, it's reaction, all that stuff. It makes a fantastic shortstop, and she is a darn good one. Sandra Cock out of the circle to scoop the roller. She gets the first two here in the top of the sixth. Last inning, she had Texas down to its final strike within an out of a run rule victory. And Mia Scott pounded an RBI single into the outfield to slice the deficit to seven and give the Longhorns a little bit of life as they try and stave off their second defeat here in the early season. So Texas is going to turn around and play a very hungry Auburn team that's a perfect 7-0 after this. From the player's perspective, doubleheader, you've done it a million times in your life, maybe triple header, right? What's the best and the worst part of multiple games in a day? <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, uh, I did not enjoy doubleheaders at all. <laughs> uh, you're, you just have to feel for a really long time, and there's nothing wrong with that. 
um, you just you're gassed by the end of the day and there's something to be said about playing fresh and playing one game and then being done it's, uh, much more rewarding and uh, the food in between is not super great most of the time that's the other problem you're like I want a full meal I'm starving and they're like here's a <laughs> peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> Although sometimes the classic just hits right. PB yeah, and J. That's, that's also true, yeah. But it's definitely a grind. The preseason tournaments, and we used to play our conference series. We'd play a doubleheader and then one game on Sunday. But... You gotta be in it for the long haul, right? Yeah. Seminoles back to the bat rack. Bottom six. Don't forget about Virginia Tech either. Blacksburg, Virginia, home to one of the best pitchers, not only in the ACC, Queen Keels, they call her Keely Rochard, a master of the strikeout as well. You've got Florida State, Clemson, Tech, and Duke, and Notre Dame in this field as well to make out your top five in the league preseason. And what is a league on the rise, Caleb Bro? Yeah, really, really talented upcoming league. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the commitment to excellence in the ACC for softball has grown tremendously in the last few years. And when you add the new talented players like Valerie Cagle for Clemson, like Akili Rochard for Virginia Tech, those are program changing players that give them an opportunity to make it to a super regional and their hopes are to make it to a women's college world series this year and if you listen to the seven innings podcast our girl amanda scarborough said that she predicts two potentially three acc teams potentially making their way to the women's college world series this year so watch out amanda bold predictions what do you mean if i listen to the seven innings podcast <laughs> When you listen to this. When you listen. When. That's out every week. Hosted by our fearless leader, Beth Mowens. And a wide-ranging array of contributors. I looked at the Zoom screen for that, for the first edition of the podcast this week. And uh, that's, like a, that's like a Brady Bunch experience in there, where you got, you got a lot of people in the Zoom window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had... Opening weekend, we had everybody join, but I think it'll be a little bit more of a rotation. Trade-off weeks on who's going to be on the podcast, but it was fun. We had Danielle Laurie, Madison Shipman are going to join up again this year and give their insight. Love hearing from those two. So it's it's. What could you love more other than a bunch of people talking about softball? No, I love it because I always learn something new, which is great yeah. because. You get the full spectrum of, you know, there's talk about the SEC, the ACC, Big 12, Pac-12. But then where we get into shagging stats is I love when, when players from non-power conferences get highlighted there. And that's what makes it a lot of fun to learn about, let's say, a player like Haley Dulcini, who yeah. comes to Texas from Fresno State and was one of the best racking up strikeouts last year. Yeah, and you know, we actually interviewed her on the podcast last year when she was at Fresno State, and I remember talking to her, and she was just so laser-focused, so mature, and we heard that from Coach White, too. He was like, she's one of the most cerebral players that I've ever had, and he loves being in the bullpen with her because she just thinks on a different level. So after Muffley made the great catch to start off the sixth, in the field at shortstop, she gets her first at bat of the day. Her athleticism, by the way, you see it with her defense. She also played hockey growing up. Not unusual if you grew up in Michigan and she smokes it through the middle for a base hit. Florida State may be well in the lead, but they're not satisfied with just seven as they keep swinging against the third pitcher they've seen today. This was a hot shot right back at check. Got all of that one, laced it up the middle. And that's just a good quality, simple swing right there, not trying to do too much. And we've seen that quite a few times from this Florida State team. It's just 
If they get something in their wheelhouse, it's really simple. Point A to point B. You're taking your bat from its starting position to contact and not trying to do too much. Sometimes it's beneficial just to be short and simple, square the ball up, pop it back up the middle. And how many ground balls, hard ground balls, line drives have we seen up the middle today? A lot from Florida State. It seemed like that third inning hit parade was all balls yeah. that just went right back up the middle. Even the home run, dead center. This is Bellevue in an 0-2 hole. And she's down swinging against Czech, who has her first out of the inning. Well, Edenfield got the start at catcher. She homered. And this is Lepresti making her second plate appearance. One of the other things, too, that's good about this early portion of the season with this schedule is that you get a chance to go a little bit deeper on the roster for Lepresti, who's been a reserve, and get some crucial innings here against the top 10 team. Yeah, no doubt. And the more depth you have in the roster, the better. And you always have to be prepared. Injuries happen. Sometimes as a catcher, especially, you just need some breaks. So to be able to get some quality experience or quality ABs to make you better prepared down the stretch is invaluable. One and two, Mudge at second base. And a couple off the plate from Czech, two and two. Good discipline yeah, in those last three. Yeah, we talk about the experience for these hitters to get an opportunity early in the season, but this is also a really important moment for Czech. Yes, you're down eight runs, excuse me, seven runs, but at the same time, you're going to face quality hitters right now where you have to elevate the level of your play to make sure that you're still working your spins, your locations, and this is a learning opportunity for her and is going to be, it's going to pay off when they go to Big 12 play, when they face somebody like an Oklahoma team that is, without a doubt, the best hitting team in the country. So again, these moments matter early in the year. So a 3-2 count here on Lepresti. Game hanging in the balance. Florida State got one in the first, another in the second, six in the third where they really gain separation and one more in the fourth here comes the three two and it's lined over to first caught double play inning over back against the wall today tex from staying undefeated to go to seven and oh they used a six run third inning to build their lead and after pitching just one inning yesterday in their win against tennessee sander cock has been dominant in the circle this afternoon. Yeah, Florida State team just really firing on all cylinders, so effective today in both offensively and in the pitching circle. Kat Sandercock has stayed so efficient today, really going right after batters, trusting her velocity, trusting that drop ball low in the zone. And then on the other side of things, been really impressed with Florida State's aggressiveness at the plate. They came in with a plan. They knew what Shea O'Leary was throwing early in the game. They jumped all over it. And you can see right there, putting up a nine spot. 
shows that they executed perfectly what they were going into this game planning for. Their offense has slowed. They had 10 of their 11 hits in the first three innings. That's been quite all right, given the lead that they built. As part of the battery here as well, Katie Bright is in behind the plate for Florida State. As Lauren Burke leads off in the Texas 7th, down 7. You and Burke go back a little ways, huh? Yes, we do. Lauren is uh, from Eugene, and so am I. We went to the same high school, and uh, I actually was her high school coach for a couple seasons. <laughs> Lauren was in the uh, large group that departed Oregon when Mike White left for Texas and found a new home, and I know she's flourished in, in Austin. On 2-2, two -two, she chases low. Sander Cock earns the strikeout. She's retired five in a row as she powers her way toward a complete game. Yeah, that's that movement. Sander Cock so effective. Burke's first at bat got her on an outside pitch, spinning it away. On that last at bat, it's the drop with that down spin. So aggressive. And all but likely to have a win in her back pocket and gives way to the first appearance of the year for Brianna Enter. The junior gets a pop-up and has the Knowles within one out of victory to improve to a perfect 7-0 to start the year. Enter was a red shirt last year. Her second season in Tallahassee. So last year, pitched just one total inning. And her true freshman season, the shortened 2020 campaign, she pitched in 13 games. And here comes in, throws just a couple of pitches. Bethany is keen on that ball on the backhand and takes care of business, as do the Seminoles. A top 10 matchup, Florida State, the better team, start to finish 9-2 the final. All around, Florida State looks so dominant. They are showing why they're one of the best teams in the country. Looking forward to seeing them the rest of this tournament. Especially Sunday night, 7 Eastern ESPN against UCLA. For our entire crew, my partner Caleb Rowe, I'm Mike Cousins. More softball can be found throughout the day. Just fire up the ES.